Turn your Bible to the book of Genesis 18 with me tonight, please. Genesis chapter number 18, verse 1. Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 1. And the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that you shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent and to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Father, bless your holy word tonight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. In the book of Genesis, chapter number, there's so many things of the beginning. For example, the book of Genesis begins, the book of beginnings. And you can find themes that begin in Genesis that run throughout the whole Bible and are not uh, brought to fruition until you get to the book of Revelation. Uh, there may be, before Genesis chapter number 18, a intercessory prayer, but not like you find it here. This is the first record that I can find in the Bible of a man who intercedes for other people. And intercessory prayer is the most unselfish of all the types of praying that one can do. Abraham was a man of sterling character, folks. It wasn't perfect, no, but he was a man of sterling character. God said, I know him, and I know he will direct his house. Now compare him with Lot, who had uh, literally lost control over his house and because of his location in Sodom. So Abraham is intervening here in the book of Genesis chapter number 18 on behalf of someone else. Now, sometimes when you, when you uh, intervene on their behalf or you intercede on their behalf, it's because they can't do it for themselves. Sometimes you can be so bound up in sin that you, don't, uh, you can't pray anymore. It's got a, strang a stranglehold on you. Sometimes your burdens can be so strong that they drive you down and you don't see any way out and your prayer is taken from you. It's hard to imagine that you could find yourself in a situation like that in this world, but you can. Believe me, you can. And this is where you need spiritual brothers and sisters, somebody who has enough discernment to intercede on your behalf. And that makes you strong and it makes your church strong. When you have people that pray for each other, they are intercessors. Now, when you pray for each other, you know, we request prayer on Wednesday night. That's a good thing. Uh, pray one for another, the Bible says. But an intercessor, I think, is someone who goes a little deeper. He literally places himself in the position of the, un of the other person. If you'll look at Genesis chapter number 18, and uh, look carefully, Genesis chapter number 18. And if you look at verse number 23, Abram drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, what Abraham is doing is appealing to the character of God. And folks, there is no book on this earth that can reveal the character of God to you like the Bible. That's what the Bible's about. It's, about, it's, it's to tell you about the Lord. God is a person, folks. He's not some kind of an ethereal spirit floating around out here in, in, nether, in the netherworld. God is a person, and uh, he is a spirit being, yes, but he's a person. When you think about a human being and all the attributes that make up the personality of a human being, remember this, you're made in the image of God. All of us are, and this image is what Christ came to restore that Adam lost. So here in the book of Genesis, chapter number 18, Abraham says, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, I can answer that for you, and you can answer it too. No. 
he will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? This was the argument of Genesis 18. Shall he? Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? You better believe he'll do right. He'll do right with you personally in your life. He'll also do right as it relates to mankind in the day of judgment and sin. God will do right. He can't do anything but right. And the Bible says that here in Genesis chapter number 18 that Abraham brought God on the carpet. He knew what was about to happen. So he judged him. Now that takes some gall to do that. Abraham said, are you going to judge, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? Notice what happens in verse number 24 and 25. He begins to intercede. He said, there be 50 righteous within the city. Will they also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous? That be far from thee to do after this manner. Abraham said, I don't believe in my heart at all that you'd do that. Verse 25, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? The Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. God Almighty is such a gracious God that he will allow the wicked to get away temporarily to deliver the righteous. He will bless you, and in blessing you, sometimes the wicked uh, receive a blessing, a peripheral blessing, because he has blessed you. That's what Laban said, remember? Laban said to Jacob, he said, I have learned by experience that God has blessed me because of you. <laughs> and Laban was smart. He certainly was. His, uh, he, he, Laban dealt in the area of subtlety and, uh, and uh, subterfuge and half-truths and uh, cunningness. That was Laban. That's, how, that's, that's, that's the code that he lived by. And he could spot it in somebody else. You know the old axiom, it takes a thief to know a thief. And uh, there's a lot of truth in that. The spirits witness with each other, don't they? And if you have the Holy Ghost in you, it's going to witness with someone else if they have the Holy Ghost in them. But if you're dealing with an Elmer Gantry, you know, an Elmer Gantry, you all understand the movie that was Burt Lancaster starred in it 30, 40, 50 years ago about a about a charlatan fly-by-night preacher. Uh, are there any charlatan fly-by-night preachers around? <laughs> Few of them, yes. And Elmer Gantry was the personification of all of that. And of course, you couldn't trust him. You couldn't believe him. He was a liar and a deceiver. So here in the book of Genesis 18, we're dealing with a man who deals with issues face on. Abraham was interested in somebody else's soul. Now, that's a high moral thing, folks. He wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about Lot, and he was thinking about Lot's family. And then if there had been any other righteous souls down there in Sodom, Abraham was willing to intercede for them. That's, uh, that's what you call magnanimous. It's when somebody, it's when somebody lives for somebody else or some higher principle or some higher thing than themselves. That's called altruism. In other words, they live for a purpose and an ideal that has a basic meaning that's greater than themselves. They're not, it's not all about me, and it's not all about the individual. It's about somebody greater than me. My life is not about me, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if my life glorifies God, what greater thing could happen to it? So here in the book of Genesis chapter number 18, verse 25, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. See the graciousness of God? And Abram answered and said, behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Notice the progression of his, of his appealing to God. First he says, he says, verse 23, wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Then he says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Then he says, I am but dust and ashes. See the progression? See the progression? He's dealing with God's character, and he's speaking to God on the level of a human being. Could God have destroyed them? Absolutely. But there's something about the nature of God, and Abraham knew it. He knew that God would not destroy the righteous. Abraham knew that. But what he did was put it in context. You follow me now. 
He put it in context. So what do you mean by that? God, Abraham knew the character of God, but he wanted to apply that character, make a practical application to somebody that was alive right there on this earth at that time. And he did, of course, with Lot. But when he did this, he wanted God to understand that he did not feel like he had the authority to command God to do anything. You remember, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Lord, remember, I know what I am. I'm just dust and ashes. There's something about humility, if it's real humility. Now, do you believe this is real humility? I certainly do. This is not a show. Abraham did not believe he was anything more than dust and ashes. If you remember when Melchizedek showed up over there after he came back from the slaughter of the kings, when he, when he went to rescue Lot, the Bible says that when Melchizedek showed up, Abraham paid tithe to him. Now, I don't know if that's the first time Abraham had ever seen Melchizedek. I have no idea. There's no way to, there's nothing to, you know, there's no, there's no scripture for it one way or another. Uh, I haven't read what the old Jewish commentaries uh, uh, have to say about that, but you've got to be careful with that because a lot of it's just tradition. But the bottom line is when he, when he, came, to, when he came to Melchizedek, he paid him tithe. And it tells you in the book of Hebrews that the less is blessed of the greater. The Bible says that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Now think about that for a minute. Abraham had been called out of Ur of the Chaldees. In Genesis chapter number 12, God said, I will bless him that blessed thee and I will curse him that cursed thee. God had given a specific blessing to Abraham that was different from anybody else on the face of the earth. God had blessed Abraham. Think about it now. Think about it. God blessed him. Could there be a greater blessing than God? If God had blessed Abraham, uh, if I'd been around back in those days, I'd have been Abraham's buddy. <laughs> Believe me, I'd been his sidekick. <laughs> sure would have, because I, you would know quickly God's hand was on Abraham. But Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, blessed him. And I do not believe that it was a continuation or a reiteration or an emphasis upon the blessing that God had already given him. I believe this was a blessing that could only come from Melchizedek. It opens up a mystical thing in the Old Testament, and that's this. There are places in the Old Testament when you come to them like this with Melchizedek. For example, you come to the father of Moses' wife. You remember him, Jethro? He was the priest of Midian. These are men in the Old Testament who had a knowledge of God before a Bible was ever written. Remember, there's no Bible here when Abraham is talking to God in Genesis 18. There's no Bible when Moses is back there in the, in the backside of the desert in Midian and his wife's father is Jethro, the priest of Midian. There's no Bible existing in, in existence. Therefore, the knowledge that anyone had of God in those days had to be handed down verbally or it had to be a direct revelation from God. God had to appear to them. There's no other way because there's no book to open up and read, no book available. So God did not leave himself without a witness. He left him, he did not leave himself without a witness. And he witnessed to these and Melchizedek must have been a very, very important person. Melchizedek was associated with Mount Moriah. He was associated with where they built the temple. Melchizedek was associated with sacrifice and offering to God. His name means priest, king, Melech, Sedek. Melech in Hebrew is, is king and Sedek is righteousness. So he is the king of righteousness. And so we have a man who is a king, a righteous king, who is a priest, who has the authority to bless someone and he blessed Abraham. Now what did Abraham do? Throw it back in his face? No, he received it. He received it and he paid tithe to him. What does that say? That shows again his humility. Abraham was a humble man. Now, do you remember Moses? Do you remember when Moses, the Bible says of Moses that he was a very humble man? Moses was humble. He had a temper. Yeah, oh boy, did he ever have a temper. <laughs> Ye, what did he call him when he came off the top of the mountain and had those tables of stone in his hand? <clears throat> said, you rebels, something like that. And, uh, and then the second time he showed his temper was when he, instead of speaking to the rock, he did what? Smote the rock. 
second time. Moses had a temper, got him in trouble, but he was a humble man. He was a humble man. And because of that humility, God was able to bring him closer to himself than he could anybody else. Listen, intellect, knowledge, ability, uh, uh, achievements, accomplishments, and least of all what men say about you get you into the presence of God. What gets you into the presence of God is humility. Humility. When you come to the New Testament, there's only one man, the Bible said, that went down to his house justified. Only one in all the New Testament. Now, others were, but there's only one man that the Bible specifically says, and if I miss it, you show me somewhere. Maybe I have. But as far as I can remember, the only man in the New Testament that the Lord Jesus said, and this man went down to his house justified. Who was it? He was the guy that smote on his breast and wouldn't even so much as lift his head toward heaven and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's humility. That's humility. The Bible says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. And anytime you see that word grace show up, what that means is God is going to use grace to convey to you something you need badly. Faith comes by grace. Salvation by grace. Healing by grace. This walk with God, therefore, is for the humble. And humility is something that God gives you by grace if you'll accept it and receive it and uh, put yourself where you belong. So here in Genesis chapter number 18, he says, I am but dust and ashes, remembering what God said back in Genesis to Adam, from dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty, wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? He said, if I find there forty and five, I'll not destroy it. He spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure if thou shalt find forty. He said, I will not do it for forty's sake. He said unto him again, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. See this? He said, I know I'm interceding. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. He said, I will not destroy it for 20. Look what happens. Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And the Lord went his way. And as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, Abraham returned to his place. That's instructive. Lot was in his place, and Abraham was in his place, and he couldn't even find ten souls. Now, we have no idea how many people lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, but I would venture to say it would be the thousands. Wouldn't you? Well, certainly. I mean, we're not talking about millions, but we're talking about a, a big enough city here, the, the, the big cities of the plain, probably thousands. Out of all those thousands of people, you couldn't even find ten. When the Lord Jesus said, and the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? It's a handful anymore that believes the truth. Did you know that? You are in the minority, folks. You are vastly outnumbered. Got a lot of religious folk around you, but they don't have any real saving faith, no true faith. Now think about it for a minute. Think about it. When God came down here in Genesis chapter number 18, he said this to Abraham. And it was quite a, it's quite a revealing thing. He said, shall I hide from my servant that which I'm about to do? He wanted him to know what he was about to do. Shall I hide from him what I'm about to do? And he awakened within Abraham what he knew Abraham had within him. You don't see Lot interceding for Abraham. You don't see Lot praying for anybody. I doubt if Lot prayed for Lot. I doubt if Lot prayed for his daughters and his sons-in-law. Everything Lot had that had any meaning to it whatsoever was already gone. It had already been destroyed with his relationship with Sodom. It ruined him. But he had a, who was Abraham to him now? His uncle. He had an uncle that prayed for him. He had an uncle praying for him. You know what happened out there in the field when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah? Look over here in Genesis 19. I'll have to find it. Uh, Genesis 19, and get on down here. 
And uh, it's where it says, And the Lord remembered Abraham. Where's that at? 29? Thank you, brother. Genesis 19, 29. It came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out to the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. Then therefore, the intercession of Abraham, it was Abraham's faith that delivered Lot from destruction. If Lot had been left in there uh, based upon Lot's faith, then Lot would have died with the wicked. Now that didn't mean Lot would have gone to hell, but he probably would have died with the wicked. But in order for Lot to be delivered and his life to be spared on this earth, uh, he had to have somebody interceding for him. Now, have you got anybody in your family that needs intercession? You got any stuff going on in your family where somebody needs to be praying for them? You know, I see so many times that people, they get down, they, 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 they're addicted to drugs, their home's coming apart, uh, their children are in rebellion, uh, all the stuff that happens to people. And I hear all this, all, I hear people, they, they put them down and they say, well, they're getting what they deserve and all kinds of talk like that. And I hate to hear that. I hate to hear that. Because they need somebody praying for them. They need somebody praying. And it'll do you good to become an intercessor because you start praying for somebody other than yourself. I'll meet Abraham one day. I look forward to meeting Abraham. I really do. I look forward to meeting Abraham. I look forward to meeting Moses. I do. I look forward to meeting Daniel. Back in my office, I've got a picture hanging over my desk of Daniel standing in a den full of lions. And he's looking out the window toward Jerusalem as he did three times a day. And those lions just stand there like this, or looking up into that window, and bones all around. And you know the story over there, don't you, in the book of Daniel, what happened? God delivered Daniel, but what happened to the ones that accused him? Cast them into the den and they break their bones. They certainly did. But Daniel's standing there, I think he's got his arms behind his back like this, just safe and sound as he can be. There he stands. Daniel is mentioned in the Old Testament as one of the saints that can be delivered by his own righteousness. Yeah, yeah, Daniel is. Daniel. He's mentioned over there in the book of Jeremiah. Daniel. He's, a, he's unique. He's a unique individual. When you read the book of Daniel, study his life, you don't find, uh, you really can't find any indictments against, against him, can you? No, he's, he's, he's unique. He's a lot like Samuel. You read the life of Samuel and you can't find any indictments against him. You see these Old Testament characters, their life is just laid out for you. There it is, just the way it is. I mean, after all, when you read about David and you read about Solomon, you want to go take a bath and get cleaned up, don't you? It gets awful filthy. I remember the first time I ever read. I hadn't been saved, I guess, six months. And I, I was reading through the book of 1 Kings, and I got over there where, where, where David sent Uriah off to the battlefield, to the front, carrying his own death warrant. And I thought, man, did I read this? Did David do this? Did he do this heinous deed? And he did, of course. He did. He did. He was responsible for it. But you know why, you know why he did it, don't you? I mean, something's going on in the background. And uh, Bathsheba, later on, bore Solomon for him and uh, became his wife. But my, what a way to do it, to have an innocent man put to death. So you could try to cover up your sin, but it didn't cover it up. Do you know why? God's always got a Nathan around. You remember Nathan, the prophet who came up and gave him a little analogy about a man who had one little lamb? Yeah, there's always a Nathan. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro, behold, the evil and the good. <laughs> you can't hide from him. The Bible said, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. Achan tried to cover it inside a tent, dug a hole, and put the, the Babylonian garment, wedge of silver and gold, and covered it up, but they couldn't cover it up. You couldn't cover it up. All the things that happen to people are in the Bible. Happened to them. And it happened to them thousands of years ago. Now when I read the Bible, now think about this for a minute. I read the Bible and I, I look at it and I say, well, these people are just like us. And then I go back in secular history and here I go back all this caveman junk and all this stuff 
about how, you know, how about how man has evolved socially uh, in the past few thousand years. And I read the Bible and I look at that garbage and I think to myself, you don't know what you're talking about. 2,000 years before Christ, they were just like us. Just like us. Just like us. When Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the plains of Sodom, that they were well watered everywhere, Abraham said, take your choice. Lot made his choice. You know what happened after that? This is one of the most beautiful things in all the Bible. This is the character of Abraham. They came and they couldn't dwell together. You know the story. I know you've read it. Their herdsmen couldn't dwell together. They were, they were, they were fighting among themselves. So the land couldn't sustain them together. So they had to separate and this is because God had blessed them. He blessed Abraham and Lot enjoyed the blessing. But anyway, Abraham said, I'll tell you what, Lot. He said, you lift up your eyes and you make your choice first. You choose what you want. And the Bible says when he lifted up his eyes, he saw Sodom. And Sodom back then was not like it is, it is today over there at the Dead Sea. It was a beautiful place as the garden of the Lord, the Bible says, well watered everywhere. But of course, the problem wasn't the land. The problem was the people of the land, see. But anyway, he made his choice. But this is the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible. After Lot made his choice and separated himself to where he was going, God said to Abraham, he said, now lift up your eyes. God spoke to him. God's, and not, it's not Abraham speaking to Lot, telling Lot to choose. It's God looking at Abraham and saying, now lift up your eyes. <laughs> now I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give to you. You remember when, you remember, you remember when, when Solomon, uh, God said, ask of me what you will. What did Solomon ask for? He could have asked for money. He could have asked for fame, fortune, all of that. Well, what did he ask for? Wisdom. And God said, I'm going to give you wisdom because that's what you asked for. And you did it with the right spirit and for the right purpose. You're going, to, you're going to go out and come in before these people. You're going to have to judge them. And I'm going to bless you and give you what you asked for. But I'm not going to stop there on top of that. I'm going to give you the riches and the wealth and all the rest that goes with it. That's the way God operates. If you'll seek your priorities right and put God first and live for him and live your life for him, and, and, and intercede for other people and bear other people's burdens and get that on your heart. And you want to help people and not hurt people. You want to be a builder of walls and not a destroyer of homes. If you have that attitude in your soul, God will bless you and then the rest of it is, is incidental. Money's nothing to God. Money's nothing to him. If you'll put your life where it's supposed to be and live for the Lord, you'll do exactly what, uh, what Joshua said. You remember what Joshua told the children of Israel in the book of Joshua? He said, not one word has failed. Not one word has failed of the promises of God. Not one word has failed. And that means something when you look at somebody at the end of their life and they look at you through 75, 80, 90-year-old eyes and they'll say, he never failed me. He never failed me. He never has failed me. He never will fail me. He's been good to me. God's a good God. I, you know, there are people out here in this world who go blow themselves up for their God. And they do that because if they die the death of a martyr, a shaheed is what they call them, then they got a ticket to heaven. That's what they believe. That's what the Muslims teach. That's the only sure way you know you're going to heaven is to die as a martyr. That's right. But the Christian has a ticket to heaven that is bought and paid for at the cross at Calvary when Christ shed his blood for us to be born again. He paid the way. He made the way. He opened the gate. And then he said, I am the door. And I am the way. And there's no other way. So I'll meet Abraham one day. I look forward to it. I really do. I look forward to meeting Abraham. <laughs> I do. I look forward to meeting some of these old. I want to see Paul. I want to see Peter. I want to see John. I want to meet these men. I want to meet them. I want to meet Mary Magdalene. The first one to the tomb on that Sunday morning. She was the one stood at the cross when all the rest of them were fleeing. John, Christ's mother, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Cleophas, and I think there was another one there. There's a bunch of Marys there at the cross. All the women were standing there when he was crucified. When he was crucified. We'll meet those saints. Father, in thy holy name, I pray. Use what I've said tonight, Lord. 
Father, I pray that there may be no more to have nothing more to me than simply thy servant, Lord, and to intercede when you burden my heart and show me the need to pray for. I pray for that, Lord. I pray for that in Jesus' name, to not think highly of ourselves and we ought. I am what I am tonight, my Father, by the grace of God. Hallelujah to God, you've been good to me, Lord. You brought me up out of the merry clay, and you set my feet upon a solid rock, established my goings forth. You put a song in my heart and wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. Save me by the grace of God. In thy blessed, righteous, sweet, holy name I pray, and for Jesus' sake I ask it, and amen. Amen. Yes, sir. We'll meet Abraham. All right.